Alors, on est prêts. Je vous présente donc le euh, Dr Lisa Ayazoni, qui détient des diplômes de l'Université Harvard en médecine et en politique et administration de la santé. Depuis plus de 20 ans, elle est chercheure dans le domaine de l'évaluation des services de santé. Elle est une experte renommée des méthodes d'ajustement des risques pour prédire les coûts et les effets des services de santé. Ses recherches portent également sur l'expérience et les effets des soins de santé pour les personnes ayant des incapacités. Dr. Ayazoni est directrice du Mangan Institute for Health Policy à Boston et membre élu du Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences, deux institutions qui visent à influencer et améliorer les services de santé. On top of her many articles published in scientific journals, she has written two books summarizing her disability research, When Walking Fails, Mobility Impairments of Adults with Chronic Conditions, and More Than Ramps, A Guide to Improving Healthcare Quality and Access for People with Disabilities. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, and sorry for making such a kind of exuberant entrance here. <laughs> okay. But thank you, it was a good example about needing accommodations. Okay. I'd like to start with a case. I'm going to call this woman Becky Bader. This is a pseudonym. She's 46 years old, she's white, she's married, she has a master's in public health. She's working, she leads research projects and is a lecturer at a local university, specifically on disability studies and community health. Middle income. She had a T5, thoracic 5 level spinal cord injury the summer before she was supposed to matriculate at physiotherapy school. She did not go to PT school. She became a public health person. Um, her mother had taken DES um, during her pregnancy, and so Becky had trouble getting pregnant. Had several miscarriages, but finally she became pregnant, and now is the mother of her daughter, Dina, who's eight and a half years old. So this is what Becky told me during a research interview. My friends complained about how, when they were pregnant, the world would descend upon them and touch them and talk about everything. I kept waiting for that to happen. No one ever said a thing except, were you raped? And how did that happen? And are you really pregnant, or is that just part of your disability? After I had Dina, I can't tell you the number of people that would come up to me that I didn't know and ask, is that your child? Is that your baby? Yes. I know, but is that really your baby? You mean, did I give birth to her? Well, yeah. And I'm like, yes, I did. And then the response is, well, how did that happen? My response was always, I had sex. <laughs> That's what I did. I had sex. If you're going to be this rude to me, I'm going to give it right back to you because I don't think it's any of your business anyway. <laughs> I think that the general public doesn't know how to handle it, not at all. Even today, I have people ask me, is she yours? You look alike, but I'm not sure if she's yours. <laughs> well, she's calling me mommy. Yes, she's mine. Okay, Becky differs from the average woman with physical disability in several ways, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. She's well-educated, she's employed with a good professional job, she's got a reasonable income, she's married with many social supports, But despite these advantages, she was still subject to social stereotyping during her pregnancy, with strangers questioning her about Dina's parentage and strangers overstepping the usual societal boundaries invading Becky's privacy. So although Becky responded assertively and with a brio that one might expect from a disability studies teacher, these questions of strangers were at best annoying and at worst caused stress and aggravation, possibly evoking a physiologic response such as cortisol release, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis stress response, perhaps with negative consequences. Okay, this is book, you all know? Okay, <laughs> great, I don't need to say anything more about it, World Health Organization, or ICF. Disability is mediated by environmental factors, including societal attitudes, governmental policies, physical and communication barriers. This is President George Herbert Walker Bush on what he arguably said was the proudest moment of his pregnancy. Of his pregnancy? <laughs> oh, that was so great. Wasn't that perfect? That was perfect. I love that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great Friday slip. Presidency. 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 Yes. Oh, that was so great. Um, this was July 26, 1990. And this was the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
And now people with disabilities in the United States are sometimes out in front. These are the elite wheelers leading at the beginning of the Boston Marathon in Hopkins in Massachusetts. Um, and the ADA and other laws have mandated equal access in a variety of areas, like education, public schools are supposed to mainstream students with disabilities, employment is supposed to grant equal access to people with reasonable accommodations, public and private services, transportation, communication, media are supposed to be equally accessible to people with disabilities, public and private spaces are supposed to be accessible if it's quote, readily achievable, etc. Now, laws, laws can't guarantee attitude changes. Um, there's still employment discrimination behind closed doors, and there's a lot of physical barriers that still exist in the US. But laws are, I think, helping to change attitudes as the public sees people with disabilities participating in schools and workplaces, the media, and community life. But are there aspects where the law just can't touch in terms of social participation? Thinking about, for example, expectations along the lifespan. Intimate relationships aren't typically, well, in the United States, maybe a little bit, um, uh, controlled by the government or laws. Um, are persons with disabilities desirable partners? Marriage, a lifetime commitment to a partner. Can the law really determine that? Parenthood, again, this is the social participation we're looking at. Um, women with disabilities having babies, can the law determine that? And let me just parenthetically say, I think everything's really different for men than what I'm talking about here today. Um, what about the attitudes of certain groups within society that have unique roles, such as healthcare professionals? All right, a bunch of questions. I'm going to try to answer some of them, maybe. Um, so here's what I'm going to try to do. Give you a brief background about pregnancy and women with disabilities. Talk to you about the epidemiology, how often this actually happens. And yes, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about US statistics, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> brief discussion of my interview study, then some very preliminary findings, because I know I just don't have that much time. Um, I'm going to bring in some statements from physicians. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the strangers, like the people that Becky ran into. And then briefly, the implications. This is the project, the funding. Um, we were funded by the National Institutes for Health, um, the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development. And I had a wonderful set of collaborators, as you can see on this slide. They are an interdisciplinary group. OK, brief background. Increasing numbers of women with disabilities are living into their reproductive years. And there's probably two main threads of women who are comprising this cohort. Women with serious early onset congenital or maybe earlier in life um, physical disabilities are now, because of medical advances and other uh, therapeutic advances, living into adulthood and their reproductive years. Additionally, in the United States, what we're finding is that the obesity epidemic is not causing earlier death of younger people, but it is causing an earlier disability. And so, so we're seeing a wave of disability among younger and younger people in the U.S. because of the obesity epidemic. Guess what? There's anecdotal evidence that these women are having babies. Um, but women with disabilities have been physically, uh, historically stigmatized. Um, sexuality and their reproductive health needs dismissed. And one of my very first projects on disability many years ago, we used a national survey, nationally representative data, and we found that women with major mobility problems were 70% less likely to get asked about contraception than were their non-disabled colleagues. And why was that? I suspect some of you around the room might have some speculation. We won't go into this now. But obviously, this if physicians don't talk to them or practitioners don't talk to them about contraception, they won't have the ability to control their reproductive um, preferences. Now, um, at the time, the um, funding agency was explicitly interested in physical disabilities. <coughs> That's women with difficulties walking and using their arms or hands. But I want to make the important point um, that there is a history, at least in the US, I don't know about here in Canada, of forced sterilization and other abuse um, relating to reproductive rights that was more pronounced for women with other types of disabilities, like intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so I just want to make that point before I go on to talk about physical disability where women also were affected, but to a lesser degree. OK, so the research project had three aims. We were going to look at numbers, how often this occurred, 
Then we were going to do a medical record route review to look at quality of care. And then we were going to do interviews to develop the exper experiential kind of hypotheses. And today, I'm just going to talk about names one and three. OK, so epidemiology. We use the 2006-2011 National Health Interview Survey that's run by the National Center for Health Statistics in the United States. It's an annual survey. It's what we use to kind of come up with our nationally representative information about health and health risks for civilian, non-institutionalized U.S. residents. In the sample adult core that's administered to a randomly sampled person from every family who's 18 and older, they ask a lot of questions about health and functioning, but they also ask women 18 to 49 if they are currently pregnant. And it's a survey with a great response rate, about 82% in the most recent year. So we had about 47,900 women um, in our sample. Um, we eliminated women. Um, who didn't say anything about the pregnancy, didn't answer any of the functional status questions, and seven women who had Alzheimer's disease that I just thought were probably, this was not relevant to. Um, and so our final sample was 47,700 or so women, 6.6% proxy response. So our physical disability indicator was based on being able to walk, climb stairs, stand, sit, bend, kneel, stoop, reach over the head, use their hands to grasp lift and carry. Um, and we focus specifically on chronic conditions. So okay, let's talk about current pregnancy in this sample. Um, all women, 3.5% said that they're currently pregnant. Women without current chronic physical disability, that's 3.8%. And women with any chronic physical disability, 2.0%. And we looked at different levels of severity. And as you can see, as severity increases for, people, for women with chronic physical disability, the pregnancy rates decrease. Also, I said earlier that Becky Bader was kind of counter-normative in, in terms of her kind of demographic characteristics. And this is what we found. I don't know if this is true in Canada as well, but um, women with disabilities, is probably true in Canada, are more likely to be older, um, more likely to be black, less likely to be Asian, less likely to be Hispanic more likely to be divorced or separated, more likely to have less than a high school education, less likely to live in households with children, to be employed, more likely to live in poverty, and more likely to have health insurance and usual care. All right, this is kind of a complicated um, logistic regressions that we did, but basically what we did was we predicted, we predicted current pregnancy based on all these sociodemographic characteristics. And what we found was that compared with women without chronic physical disability, the adjusted odds of current pregnancy for women with chronic physical disability was 0.83. But if you look at the 95% confidence intervals around that estimate, cross is one. So basically, once you control for these factors, women with chronic physical disabilities are having babies at the same rates as our other women. Now, that's a really big statement because the major predictor here was age and also marital status. And age is really what's driving this. And so women with chronic physical disabilities are older. That's why they really have the on raw rates apparently lower. But I still think it's kind of interesting to think that once you control for age and all these other factors, that women with chronic physical disabilities are currently pregnant at the same rate as our other women. And so here are what the population estimates are. You take these numbers, you can roll them up. 8.3 million women of childbearing age have at least some chronic physical disability in the United States. Three, per, three million of those have severe physical disabilities. 163,000 um, women with at least some chronic physical disability are pregnant at some time during the year. And that includes 44,200 women with severe physical disabilities. OK, so I hope I've convinced you that this is not a totally rare phenomenon. OK, so experiential dis interviews. Now, I understand that this is kind of a day for you to learn about research and learn about research techniques. And so I'm going to tell you some of the really bad things that happened with my study. All right, just so, just so you can realize that even a senior investigator like me, an old person who's been doing this for years, can have things go wrong. All right, so, um, so we designed this, um, this interview protocol that was going to take two hours to, um, to, to do. And I was actually going to do all the interviews. And um, I prefer in my research projects, if I possibly can, to interview people where they live. 
I will go to their homes if I can, because it's kind of almost like a little anthropologic participant observer thing, because obviously I roll in in my wheelchair. I can kind of get a sense of what it's like to get around their home environment. I can get a feel for that. We were going to randomly select 20 participants from all those women that we identified in A2 through the medical record reviews. Well, guess what? Obstetricians at our high-risk, very large hospital that sees tens of thousands of women for deliveries each year do not document functional impairments in OB records. We couldn't find any women in the OB records based on the obstetrical documentation. So um, we couldn't really go that route um, to find these women. All right, so, so we were aiming again for 20 women, and in qualitative research, there's no absolute number of how many people you should interview. You're kind of aiming for a thematic saturation where the next interview doesn't really tell you much more than the last one did. Purpose of sample, not generalizable, but from our obstetrical partners at the MGH Mass General Hospital, we got nothing. I'm on the board of the Boston Center for Independent Living, a private nonprofit advocacy organization and service organization for people with disabilities. I asked them, could they recommend women? Nothing. They didn't know any women there who could have babies. Um, we contacted 11 sports and other advocacy organizations in Boston for people with disabilities. We got no recommendations. My research assistant, Amy, had a childhood friend um, who was working in spinal cord injury. <laughs> she knew they, they found one person for us. Actually, I think it was Becky Bader. Um, and then, Joy, I emailed some people in Chicago who I knew. And suddenly, the flyer got posted on a Facebook group. And it got posted on another Facebook group. And within a 48-hour period, 20 women had contacted us. And within about a week, we had 45 contacts. And so this is going to be really actually interesting when we think about research methods, is getting people through social media and what kind of non-generalizable sample this is going to be. But you know, if this is the way we have to go about it, because obstetricians are not documenting functional status in their records, you know, there's a lot of kind of caveats about this sample, but this is what we found. So in a six-week period, because I wanted to be responsive to these women who'd called, so I wanted to do this as quickly as possible, I did 22 two-hour interviews <laughs> by phone with women across the country. And so we're right now um, analyzing 22 transcripts of about 35 pages, single space each, using ground theory. We're very busy. Okay, so these 22 women had significant physical disabilities, most of them used wheelchairs, diverse causes, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy were common, but there were a range of other conditions that you'll see in some of the comments that I'm about to give you. 20 white, this is where the non-generalizable comes in, one black, one Native American, two were Latina, 11 were on Medicaid, which is the insurance program for poor people in our country when they've had their baby, uh, but all across the mainland U.S. and not generalizable, but at least hopefully hypothesis generating. Whew, all right, so there's my little warts below our methods. <laughs> okay, so here's some preliminary findings relating to attitudes. Okay, overall, by definition, the women in our sample had all quote unquote participated. They'd all had babies. Okay, so by design, our study had not included any women who hadn't given birth. Therefore, we can only examine the experiences of women where societal attitudes had not prevented them from bearing a child. But societal attitudes had nonetheless affected their pregnancy experiences, some positive, some negative. I only have time to discuss a few. Okay. Now, this one really blew me away. All right, so childhood physicians. Five of the 22 women perceived that their childhood or young adulthood physicians had told them that they could not become pregnant. This was three women with, with spinal cord injury and two with cerebral palsy. Now, again, these are women's perceptions, their memories, and so I can't absolutely say that this is exactly what happened, but nonetheless, the women's perceptions have internal validity to them. This is what women thought their doctors had said. So let me just say, parenthetically though, there is absolutely no scientific evidence for any of these assertions. Women with spinal cord injury, 
sometimes lose their menses but regain it pretty quickly within like five months typically after the injury. Um, women with cerebral palsy, typically it doesn't affect the reproductive tract. There were nine born women across these, nine born children across these five women. So obviously what the doctors had said wasn't true. But as a consequence, some of these women had not used birth control. Some of them got pregnant the first time, basically. And therefore they could not control when their pregnancy occurred. Now, did these statements that the physicians represent their views that the women shouldn't get pregnant rather than that they couldn't get pregnant? <coughs> we don't know. Let's talk about Cecilia Ramirez. She's 31, she's Latina, she's married, she's got some college, she's unemployed, she, her income is from Social Security Disability Insurance. She has cerebral palsy, but she now has three sons, ages one, three, and six, pretty quickly, one right after another. Cecilia had been adopted from South America, and when she had been brought into our country, she was given a complete physical exam by a physician. They told my mother, in passing, don't expect grandkids, because with her body, with having a short torso and a smaller rib cage than most people, the likelihood of her getting pregnant would be sort of a miracle. Well, think about the anatomy here. <laughs> you know, this just doesn't actually compute. And obviously it didn't. Um, she has three kids. Um, but Cecilia went from childhood into early adulthood thinking she could never have a baby. She did not seek other opinions when she got older and started thinking of having a family. I didn't really start talking to anybody. I just figured I have a belief in God. So I figured if it was meant to be, it would happen. If it wasn't, I would adopt. Cecilia and her husband wanted children and used no birth control. They got pregnant after eight months. All right, strangers' attitudes, themes. There were a range of attitudes. Happy, positive, congratulatory, curious, how did that happen? Lots of women told me that same exact sentence, people telling them, how did that happen? Intrusive curiosity, overstepping usual societal boundaries, sometimes causing stress. Hostile expectations as a child would need state support and thus cost the taxpayer money. Pregnancy not noticed, even though it was pretty obvious. Okay, so let's give you a couple of examples of this. Curious, intrusive. Nicole, T5 spinal cord injury. This man said, I wasn't sure how to ask you, but I didn't know you could even do that. And how did that happen? And I said, same way it happens for every other woman. Use your imagination here and stop looking at me like that. <laughs> I'm very aware of people around me, and people definitely wondered everywhere I went. I got more stares than usual. Hostile, judgmental, anticipating the baby would be a burden to the state. Margie with atherogryposis, which is a congenital condition where two or more joints are seriously deformed. I get so many dirty looks, how horrible I am to bring a baby into this world when I'm not even fit to be a mother. At Walmart, some people were thrilled and other people had the nerve to say, what do you think you are doing? You are just a waste of society. Anne Marie, arthrogryposis, and this woman was French Canadian actually, um, heritage. The worst was, oh God, another child I'm gonna have to pay for. I was about seven and a half months pregnant and I had, was into the bitchy mommy stage. I turned around and said, I have two college degrees. How about you? And she looked appalled and she walked away. <laughs> but it was an automatic defense mechanism that I try not to do. I try very hard to be politically correct and let people have their own opinions and walk away, but I was so hormonal and it just kind of came <laughs> People who don't see the possibilities don't recognize what is in front of their eyes. I was hugely pregnant, Lauren, with osteogenesis imperfecto. We went to Babies R Us. Do you have something like that here? It's just kind of like baby store. Okay. To get a few last minute things. We asked where something obscure was. The lady led us to it and said, oh, are you going to be parents? And we said, yeah, we're going to be parents very soon. She grabbed her heart and said, I'm so glad they let people like you adopt. <laughs> what? Don't you see my giant stomach? Mine was definitely visible, but I think people just don't compute. 
the stairs were a lot longer and just a lot more, I think, confused. I think they were trying to figure it out. Could that be? Then Lauren, again, where we live is super diverse. We, there, she's talking about racial and ethnic um, diversity in her neighborhood. There's this one group of ladies in traditional headwear would walk all the time, and I would push Lily around our loop there. I've been doing it for weeks, and one of them came over and said, oh, she's real. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. They thought I was just some crazy person pushing a doll. <laughs> for the most part, I find amusement in that stuff because it's just so ridiculous. All right, finally, some positive feelings, just to kind of leave you with a, with a kind of good, warm feeling. Maureen Finley um, is used to people staring at her, but during her pregnancy, she felt as if she glowed. She felt this glow was, in fact, infectious, and that she got positive comments from strangers on the street. So let's talk about Maureen. She's in her thir early 30s. She's white. She's missing all limbs except six inches of one arm. And her adoptive mother had told her the cause of this when she was 10 years old, because Maureen really wanted to have a baby. But she was concerned that if she had a baby, her baby would not have any limbs either, just like she didn't. And so one day she was very tearful and asked her adoptive mother, you know, will my baby be like me? And her adoptive mother also tearfully told her the cause. She was the product of a botched abortion. That's how she had lost all of her limbs. And in fact, um, the perinatologist who works with us says that that can occur, that the fetus can survive the procedure. She's a PhD clinical psychologist. She describes herself as blonde, having a pretty face, but had no boyfriends during high school. There were no boys who were interested in her, going out with her. She decided, though, that she wanted to have a baby. So for a year, she swam. She made herself as physically fit as she possibly could. Then she went to a sperm bank, where everybody was actually really very supportive of her, didn't question it at all. She conceived on the very first try, which happened to be on Valentine's Day. <laughs> And she now has a baby named Ethan, who's two years old. And her friends convinced her to go onto a computer dating service. And so she actually did meet the man who I'll call Chad um, on that, and she got married this spring. All right, so the implications. Um, the implications of the epidemiology. The numbers are large enough here so that women with physical disabilities who get babies really do merit some serious consideration especially since these numbers are likely to rise in coming decades. It's essential that clinical and supportive services um, really plan for the needs of pregnancy among these women. Um, and it's essential to learn more about the physiology of pregnancy and other aspects of pregnancy to accrue the clinical evidence to guide the recommendations of healthcare professionals. Healthcare professionals. If you don't have scientific evidence about something, don't say something to a woman that is really going to affect her, um, you know, basically how she's going to approach her life and her reproductive health. Because women are going to take what you say seriously. Um, false information can have important consequences. It can put women at risk for unintended pregnancy. If they don't use contraceptives because they think that they can't become pregnant, and if they want to become pregnant at one point, but they want to control when that's going to happen, they will not have information to make fully informed choices. So finally, why should attitudes of strangers matter? What are the consequences of these comments and interactions and intrusions? Is this just really a minor inconvenience? Is it an annoyance? Is it something that's easily forgotten? Or is it more? Is it stress that's unnecessary, it's unprovoked, clearly? It's unclear, actually, and this is something that's kind of really, I would love to understand better, whether the stress hormones are activated, that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis where the cortisol releases, that people now hypothesize may be one of the reasons that African Americans in our country actually have much shorter life expectancies than to white Americans. We really need much more research to be able to understand the physiological implications of constantly having to be kind of guarded effect against the effects of stranger communication on the streets. And finally, societal attitudes. I realized that I wasn't going to really have time to go into this much, but the point that I want to make is that 
And given how strangers reacted, it's not too hard to take the leap to understand that virtually every single one of the 22 women who I interviewed were afraid of losing custody of their child. Even if they were highly professional women with a lot of accomplishments, and so you would think that they could defend themselves against this, they would sometimes admit that they understood this was an irrational fear, but they felt fear. They were afraid um, that um, there, there were actually a couple of instances where nurses would, re would tell them that they could not take their baby home until they were able to diaper the baby in exactly the procedure that the nurse wanted them to do that, rather than the adaptive procedure that the woman herself had come up with. Um, they were afraid of divorce or if they weren't married, the father of the child seeking custody and gaining it. Neighbors and strangers coming up, you know, saying these negative comments, they were concerned about these people contacting Child Protective Services to complain about them as mothers. And there's evidence in the U.S. that these fears are well-grounded, especially in legal custody disputes where the disabled parent often does not get control of custody. And there's a potential role for healthcare professionals in all of this that we really need to understand our own biases if we are going to be helping to adjudicate these kind of disputes. So I just want to end by thanking the 22 interviewees for sharing their stories. And I know this is Canada, but I always like to end my talks with Independence Day. <laughs> so thank you very much um, for listening to me. They kissed you? strategy of say going to Facebook or I've had the same experiences on yeah. you know getting people with disabilities sometimes through actual healthcare professionals is um, atrociously bad yeah, right you it's know, really and I've hard. always been floored sometimes to say I can't believe it or that one person with the stroke that was right, exactly exactly but, but I was just wondering if you could talk about that and yeah, what well, you we, think some methods would be to yeah I mean we put a time limit on the pregnancy because we wanted to be able to um, look at maternity care or centrical care more recently and so we certainly knew people who had who had children who are now in their late teens or 20s or 30s and so on you know, who are members of BCIL or something like that. And so I actually think that, um, and we had another study where we even had a worse time recruiting. Um, I think that we need to consider whether, in fact, social media may become a way to recruit in these contexts and talk about how we can better manage that and understand better the non-representativeness of the samples that we get from that approach. Because it really, especially for disability-related projects, all of a sudden, I mean, the epidemiology says that they're out there, but all of a sudden, when you want them, they're just invisible. Yeah. And did, did your research have any play then on, you were saying that um, none of the obstetricians were, were in any way accounting for disability kinds of yeah. issues in their charts or anything no. like that. Did, did they hear your results? Did they say anything? Not or? yet. Yeah, interesting. Not yet, yeah. I mean, it was complicated because the MGH has their own like kind of homemade OBEMR, obstetrical electronic medical record, and so it might be just because of the odd way that they documented charts, but yeah. Dahlia? Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I had a question also about the recruitment. Yeah. Uh, you said that it doesn't include, obviously, women who did not get pregnant because of societal abuse. I'm wondering how you think we can include um, such participants in our studies. For example, when uh, my just is health te uh, rehabilitation technologies, if they're not given access to a technology, mm -hmm. how we can identify those participants? Oh, yeah. I mean, Actively not having gotten access to a technology, I think, would be um, pretty hard to recruit unless you could find people who had the indication for the technology. 
but simply weren't given it. And I think that if we were to try to identify women who had not had babies, maybe what we could have done, done was to have gone to gynecologists and talk to them about women um, in their practice who were actively trying to get pregnant but hadn't been able to, or reproductive technology groups, or, um, or OBs who'd had to care for women with miscarriages. Because as I said, there were quite a few miscarriages actually among our population. And so we just happened to get the women who had been able to carry babies to term. But it's a tough question. I don't have any yes. user answers. You don't? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I thought it was really interesting. I was wondering because all your in your sample you only had people with or that I know uh, with physical disabilities, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you could uh, or had the chance to interview anyone with uh, intellectual disabilities. Yeah. Uh, but that and you know, if not, what's your perception of of the differences between their experiences? With, yeah. Because that would be even right. Right, no, our, our project was explicitly about physical disabilities. As I said, that was the interest at the time of the funding agency. But as I also said, um, women with intellectual disabilities have been so stigmatized. And I think that in the United States, I think um, there still are instances where the reproductive rights of those women are being compromised by guardians in the courts. Um, and forcing, maybe not sterilization, but certain types of birth control onto them. And so I think, you know, this is really um, the bioethics people. And I mean, this is really, really a hugely complicated issue. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think that I'm not equipped to actually answer this question any further because I know only anecdotal kind of feelings about this and nothing professional. I don't know whether there's anybody else in the room, Joy. Do you have any? kind of experience with intellectual and developmental disabilities in pregnancy. Yeah, anybody else? You do? No? Not about oh, you've got a question? Okay. Sorry about that, that I can't answer. No, but yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to know, uh, thanks for the great talk. Do oh, you thank have you. Um, any plans as to uh, how you're going to educate phys physicians about this? Oh, God, I know, and I won. uneducable. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I obviously, as one research project, um, we can only make a start. And um, I hope that we will be able to at least publish in obstetrical journals. And actually, publishing qualitative research is very, very difficult in the major medical journals. And so I know that the the leap between publication and actually affecting behavior is very hypothetical. <laughs> we don't even know if that really works. But I think that it can get a dialogue going. And um, fortunately, the perinatologist who is working with us is a fairly high person in his field. And so you know, once we get our papers kind of fixed and have the really honed messages for the physicians, I'm hoping that Jeff is going to be able to help us think about how to introduce some of this to his professional colleagues, because it's really a huge issue. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I just wanted to share with you uh, some information since you're in Montreal. And uh, we have a clinic here called uh, Parent Plus, mm -hmm. where actually some occupational therapists are contacting pregnant women with mm -hmm. physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. and. They do that education mm -hmm. with the team before the. Mm -hmm. So I guess you may have the same yes. model, and I'm wondering if some uh, parents in your study yes. uh, mm -hmm. had had that support. Yes. And they also support uh, uh, men in this uh, mm -hmm. process of mm -hmm. uh, thinking of having a child eventually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think this can change. Yes, um, I think I think absolutely. I had probably about um, a third of the interviewees mentioned that they had had interactions with occupational therapists that were very, very helpful to them. Um, uh, diapering babies, figuring out how to breastfeed, how to hold the baby while breastfeeding. Um, I think the home modification issue, getting a crib, that they could actually use a crib that would open from the side rather than a crib that they would have to put the baby into. But 
only in a couple of these instances had they actually been recommended by like the obstetricians. Um, again, I don't know how much kind of interaction you in the <coughs> OT and PT field here in Canada have with your doctor colleagues, but you know, it seems like there's a huge gap in the United States that could actually be filled by having a little bit more kind of interdisciplinary communication, especially around this. So yeah, there, there were some very beneficial kind of interactions with OT. I have a rather naive question to ask. Um, are there a lot of studies about pregnancy and disability, or, or is there a gap to fill, rather? There's a gap to fill. There's a big gap to fill. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, right after we got our project funded by NICHD, they issued a program announcement for more proposals to come in about this, re this area because there's so little research in it. Yeah. So um, I really enjoyed this very much, thanks for that. Uh, I'm not sure what enjoying is a proper term. I know, <laughs> it's very I, know interesting. I know, I know, um, I know, yeah. So, so I guess my question, uh, uh, so, so a lot of your, um, your interviews are with, uh, you know, basically the experience of women with uh, healthcare professionals before getting pregnant. So I was kind of wondering, what about you know, during pregnancy and so on and so forth? I mean, Oh no, we, we talked to them about during pregnancy and I just did not talk to you about the horrific, horrific experiences that some of them had. You know, some of them had great experiences, but some of them, especially with anesthesia, oh my gosh, they had some really horrible experiences. I, I had, you know, only 40 minutes for my talk. No, no, so, sure, sure. Yeah. But, but it's included in the study. It's a good oh, thing. absolutely. Okay. This is one of the first <laughs> articles that we're going to write for the OP literature, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Good. You're welcome.